My name is Michael Watson, Head of History Publishing here at Cambridge University Press. I'm very pleased to introduce both Professor Philip Nord and Professor Jay Winter. Philip is Rosengarten Professor of Modern and Contemporary History at the University of Princeton and the author of a number of acclaimed studies of modern France, including France's New Deal from the 30s to the post-war era and France 1940 Defending the Republic. His new book examines the contested commemoration of the 160,000 or so people from France deported to camps in Central and Eastern Europe during the Second World War. The book shows how their stories were commemorated in literature, art, film and monuments, and how competing Jewish, Catholic, communist and Gaullist narratives of the deportation became intricately bound up in the domestic and international politics of the post-war era. The book is published as part of the press's long-standing series, Studies in the Social and Cultural History of Modern Warfare. And I'm delighted that the series founding editor, Professor Jay Winter, is also with us today. Jay is the Charles J. Style Professor of History Emeritus at Yale University, and author of a series of hugely important books on the First World War and its impact on the 20th century, including Sites of Memory, Sites of Mourning, the Great War and the Shaping of the 20th Century, and War Beyond Words, Languages of Remembrance from the Great War to the Present, to name just a few. Thank you both for joining us today. I'm going to hand over now to Phil to introduce the book, and then um, Jay's going to add some comments. Um, and just a reminder, do keep adding your questions throughout the talk in the chat box, and we'll get to those later. Okay, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh... Thank you for making this occasion possible, and thanks also to Jay uh, for his questions and commentary. Uh, so I'll repeat a little bit uh, what Michael said, but uh, I won't take long. Uh, 160,000 people were deported from France uh, to concentration camps in Central and Eastern Europe during World War II. 76,000 of these people were Jews, uh, and almost all of them perished. Uh, 2,500 returned. Uh, the rest were Résistant and, uh, and others, uh, and uh, about half of those uh, managed to return, uh, but half, uh, half did not. Uh, so there are really two stories wrapped up uh, under the rubric of la déportation, as the French call it, the deportation. Uh, the story of Résistant on one hand uh, and of Jews on the other, and they're related stories, uh, but as I try to suggest in my book, uh, they're also different, uh, members of the same family, uh, siblings, uh, but not identical, identical twins. Uh, the focus of the book is on stories that are told about the deportation experience uh, by survivors, uh, by relatives uh, of the lost, by artists uh, who try to represent, uh, to represent uh, the experience. Um, uh, and this Representation takes place, as uh, Michael just told you, uh, via uh, a wide range of, uh, of media, uh, books, movies, paintings, poetry, uh, and also monuments. Um, and the stories are quite, uh, quite varied, uh, varied in nature. Uh, some of the Storytellers uh, are well known uh, to you. Uh, there may be some less well known. I'll just cite a few names, not go on at, uh, at great length. Robert Antelm, Charlotte Delbo, Elie Wiesel, André Schwarzbach, uh, Edgar Morin, uh, Anna Langfus, I could go on. Uh, uh, all of these works are treated uh, to one degree or another in my, uh, in my book. Uh, and the stories are patterned, uh, at least in my recounting, uh, by uh, politics as well as, uh, as well as religions. Communists uh, were, uh, entered the list early on uh, in this uh, narrative uh, contest, uh, and their story was about the anti-fascist uh, anti struggle. Uh, but there were all others who, uh, who entered the debate. The non-communist left uh, accented the imminence of the concentrationary experience in all uh, in all modern societies, and of course, Gaulists too, uh, were major players, uh, and their storyline focused on the Thirty Years' War uh, of the 20th century uh, against France's hereditary enemy, uh, that is to say, Germany. It wasn't just politics, though, that played a part uh, in all this, uh, but also religion, uh, Catholic religion, and Catholics play uh, an important part uh, in, my, in my story, and as they saw it, 
uh, they were Catholic deportees. Uh, this was a battle between the spirit on the one hand and a kind of Nazi neo-paganism uh, on the other. And there were Jews who entered early on uh, into, the, uh, into the debate, uh, sometimes uh, at, insisting on uh, the sacrifice and martyrdom uh, of the six million who were lost and by that uh, uh, by that token, inserting uh, the story of the Holocaust, uh, as it came to be known, uh, into a, a centuries, millennial old story of suffering and persecution that dated back to biblical times. Uh, these were people, martyrs who had died at Kiddush Hashem in sanctification of the name, but some of them were also heroes. So this is another story, Jewish story uh, that recurs, that emphasizes resistance, Jewish resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, but also in the extermination camps of Treblinka, uh, Helmno, and Sorbibor, Sobibor, where uh, Sonder commandos uh, rolls uh, in revolt. A multiple uh, multiplicity of stories uh, that contend that ebb and flow, uh, and that ebb and flow is shaped by historical events, uh, the Cold War, um, the Algerian War, very important in the French context, the return of de Gaulle to power in, 19, uh, in 1958. Uh, but as I lay out these stories in the ebb and flow and the contest of, among them, uh, a number of points I hope become clear along the way. And the first is that Jews were involved in the discussion right from the very, very beginning. Uh, and I won't go on in any detail, uh, but the first cornerstone of the uh, Jewish memorial, now known as the Memorial, now known as the memorial de la Shoah, uh, was laid in 1953. So the Jews were there. They were not silent, uh, as used to be thought. That was once upon a time received wisdom. I think it is uh, eroding uh, received wisdom at this, uh, at this stage. But the point is that while the Jewish voice was there, it was one among many contending and multiple voices in the first post-war decades. And I insist on contending uh, because uh, there was some serious fighting going on, particularly between Gauls and communists. And that's why I put memory battles uh, as the subtitle of my uh, of my book, but the Jewish voice will emerge uh, in the 1970s and 1980s is the preeminent one. Uh, and this so-called reversal uh, of memory, uh, as it unfolded, the totality of the uh, the tonality of the story of told about Jewish suffering uh, also began uh, began to change. In an earlier period, uh, the emphasis was on sacrifice, uh, martyrdom. Uh, or heroism, as the case may be. But later, uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, the story was now more and more turned around the experience of victimization uh, or of loss. Of course, that begs the question uh, as to why this reversal of memories took place uh, at all. Um, and many people emphasize turning points or crucial dates, like the Eichmann trial of 1961 uh, or uh, the Arab-Israeli war of 1967. Uh, these are important and do figure in my uh, in my narration, uh, but I insist a little bit more on processes, uh, interfaith dialogue in particular between Catholics and Jews, uh, but also generational uh, generational change and the arrival uh, of the generation uh, of 1968. Uh, and when I say 1968, I mean it in the long sense of the term as something that extends from the mid 60s maybe to the Mitterrand. Uh, Mitterrand years, and by invoking uh, generational change and that particular date of 68 understood in this broad sense. Uh, I implicate my story in the history of the new left. I realized that uh, maybe a little bit after the, after the fact in a couple of ways. One is that many of the militants of memory had a 68 or experience and uh, Marcelo Fools is a case in point. Uh, he was involved in a strike at state radio in 1968 and then went on to make the sorrow of the pity, uh, sorrow and the pity, which was uh, ready for airing on television uh, in nineteen uh, in nineteen sixty nine. But there's a second way in which sixty eight uh, plays a role, and that has to do with tactics, uh, sixty eight or tactics. And here I invite uh, people to think of the Klarsfelds, Beata and Serge, uh, who were serious scholars in their own way, but also serious militants who organized sit-ins, demonstrations, courtroom. Uh, antics uh, and the like uh, as a way of dramatizing and drawing public opinion uh, to the experience of, uh, of, the, of the Holocaust. 
Last substantive chapter of the book, and I'll stop after this, is given over to Claude Lansman's Shoah. Uh, and so my story really winds down in the 1990s, which is not to say that a lot doesn't happen after that, uh, just that I allude to it rather than treat it in, uh, in detail. Uh, and the reason I stopped with Lansman, one is because it's a monument and most of my uh, chapters have a monument at their, uh, at their center. Uh, including a, a chapter uh, that involves the Memorial du Tombeau uh, du Martyr Juif Inconnu, actually the Memorial du Martyr Juif Inconnu, the Memorial to the Unknown Jewish Martyr, now known as the Memorial de la Shoah since 2005. And that's another reason for ending with Lansman, because he gave the phenomenon in France and now elsewhere uh, a new name. Not just six million, the final solution, uh, or um, the Holocaust, uh, but now uh, now the Shoah. And last of all, uh, and this is the point with which I'll end, the story began to change. Uh, and the story, as I've alluded to before, uh, was not about martyrdom, but it was about a loss, devastating loss on a unique and unprecedented scale, uh, a loss consequent uh, upon a means of execution uh, that, uh, that had been unknown hereto, heretofore. And for me, the figures who stand out in Lansman's long nine-hour movie are, uh, are the Zonderkommandos, uh, those charged with uh, disposing of the bodies of the dead. Uh, the movie opens with Simon Shrebnik, who was one of these at Helmno, and it ends with him, and, and two of the most riveting testimonies uh, in the Lansman book, uh, Lansman's movie, uh, are those of Philip Miller uh, and uh, Abraham Bamba both Sonder Commandos, both who entered into the gas chambers, uh, but came out again alive uh, to, tell, uh, to tell the story. Uh, a story that is uh, not a story of redemption, heroism, or martyrdom, but a story of loss. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Phil. I personally think this is a appropriate uh, conversation to have on International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day. Um, and it, 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 it informs my, my first question uh, to you, Phil. Is, is it possible to say that uh, over the course of the 50 years from the Second World War, let's say to 1990 or the 1990s, um, the uh, French uh, memory of the deportation has become more European and less French? Uh, by that I mean what your book, I think, shows is that the Gaullist idea of the Thirty Years' War is actually an idea that um, hasn't stood the test of time, uh, that it was very important indeed uh, until the success of the European Union as a Franco-German uh, alliance at its core uh, brought um, uh, Europe into a different proximity uh, to the Holocaust and France into a different proximity with Europe. Would, would you say that, that one of your themes is, if you will, the Europeanization or the internationalization of French memory? Yeah, uh, great, uh, great question. Uh, so a bunch of uh, responses to that, starting with the Gaullist story, um, um, which is, you know, uh, how shall I put it, uh, is premised on the uh, Franco-German uh, German, uh, rivalry that has disappeared. And so the story has lost some of its uh, bite uh, as a consequence. Uh, I just say that it's having a, a bit of a rebirth uh, of, uh, of late. There's a, a, an interest in Gaulism all over again. Uh, and I don't just mean Julian Jackson's uh, biography, uh, but also a new movie about de Gaulle, accent oh. his, human, uh, his human qualities, um, and the interment in the pantheon uh, of a whole host of Second World War uh, résistants. Um, Germaine Tillon, who was a, a Gaullist herself. So it continues uh, to, uh, uh, to have a life, uh, but now no longer so anti-German in nature. Uh, it, uh, it's got a different kind of uh, enemy that's implicit, uh, enemies of human rights, uh, enemies of uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity, enemies of the Republic, uh, but not German in nature. But a second thing, and I think this is, uh, you're right on the mark. Uh, so one of the memorials I talk about is the Struthof Memorial in yeah. Alsace, which was a concentration camp 
that the Germans established there. They had annexed Alsace, uh, so it was German territory. Uh, this was a, uh, how should I put it, a, a site dear to Résistance and one uh, French, uh, and they oversaw its creation and they treated it as a French monument, although most of the people uh, who uh, were interned at Struthof were Europeans. But of late, uh, it has now become a, a center for European memory. And it actually yeah. has a centre européen, a European center of study associated yeah. with it, with uh, cars coming uh, and uh, uh, buses from all over the continent uh, there. Uh, so it is now more of a European memory. Uh, and then one more point on this <coughs> is the internationalization uh, story. And that's, that's an interesting one I don't follow uh, particularly, although the UN has picked up uh, this story of uh, having a Holocaust, a World Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day. But I, I think what I would say is that it as uh, as the Holocaust is more and more universalized in nature, uh, this is more of an opinion, I don't know that I could defend it, uh, but that its Jewish content is reduced at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's meaningful is that there's an evil uh, and that there are victims. Mm -hmm. uh, and those victims can be varied. In the case of the Holocaust, it was Jews, but you go to Rwanda uh, and it will be uh, and it will be others. Uh, as the concept globalizes, uh, it loses some of its specificity mm. process. Mm. But that, that that has happened. Mm. Well, let me let me see if I can uh, pick up that last point because it seems to me one of the uh, achievements of uh, Lanzmann's film Shoah, uh, which is a work of genius. Um, is to use a Hebrew word uh, for the murder of six million Jews, Shoah, the pillar of smoke uh, that followed the children of Israel in the desert, uh, and not the word Holocaust, which is deeply problematic because it is a Greek word symbolizing the uh, ritual sacrifice of, uh, of, an, uh, of an object that is burnt uh, and entirely consumed by fire. Now, the, the, I've always found the word Holocaust uh, impossible to accept in this context. Um, but one reason why it may have made, as it were, the, uh, the, uh, the vocabulary uh, of our discussion of this theme is because of the way the television series in the United States and then later in Germany used the word Holocaust. Whereas Shoah seems to me to be a French accretion and a, and a valuable French accretion. Uh, we know that Lanzmann had a uh, dedication to the state of Israel, at least in part of his life, and it varied, but he was a man yeah. who believed very much in the Israeli army and its uh, its forging of a nation and so on. But the, what, I, what I'd like to ask you is whether the very word Shoah shows that the Frenchness of memory has not been entirely internationalized. The word Shoah is what is used here in Paris uh, today, it was used in all of the ceremonies, uh, that were conducted today. Uh, is it the case that in language um, there still is a French version of the story of uh, of Jewish suffering? That's a good question. Um, so let's uh, review the options. Um, uh, and it was uh, a matter of uncertainty and I won't say of overt debate. In the case of Lanzmann, yes, overt. Um, so uh, the word Holocaust, as you say, has a, a uh, originates in the Greek. And in the French context, uh, it's er used early, particularly by Catholic interlocutors. Uh, and they do see the sacrificial dimension uh, as part of the story uh, of the uh, murder of the six million, uh, six million Jews. Uh, and they insert it into a larger eschatology, uh, which is ultimately going to lead to uh, uh, the return of uh, uh, Second Coming, uh, the reintegration of Jews into, uh, into the proper church, uh, and uh, that is, say, the Christian one. Uh, and uh, this is a vision. It's implicit in the use of the word, and it's one that French Jews are uncomfortable with. Uh, and so they use the murder of the six million or their Yiddish urban. Uh, there are other voc And so there's a search for another kind of vocabulary. Uh, and Lanzmann, I feel, participates in this as mm. well. Uh, that's accented for him, uh, is that he made his movie, at least in part, uh, in contradistinction to the series yeah. 
miniseries in the United States. Uh, and so he wasn't going to call it Holocaust. He didn't like that movie. I think it's better than he thinks it was, but that's another, uh, another <laughs> subject altogether. Uh, but he didn't want that word. Uh, and so twice over for aesthetic reasons and also for more substantive reasons, he wanted something different. Uh, and as you say, he had an ongoing relationship with Israel in his, uh, in his life. And it, I don't know if it's something we want to talk about. Uh, but he didn't know Hebrew, uh, but he was exposed to the word Shoah. Uh, and its strangeness and sense of difference uh, appealed to him. Not only is I now I don't have to use the word Holocaust, but I also have something that uh, suggests an aspect of the phenomenon, uh, not sacrificial, uh, but accented Ooh. instead on disaster, loss, calamity, uh, that will be closer to his or to my, uh, speaking in Lance Mott's Ooh. shoes, uh, to my version of what this experience was really all about. Right, right. Well, let's let's develop in another this question in another direction, uh, Phil. Um, I have always been puzzled. Uh, by the Christology of Marc Chagall, uh, of dressing Christ on the cross in a talit. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how you understand the Frenchness? It's certainly not from the Stiebel, you know, in uh, uh, Bielorussia. Uh, it's not, not Vitebsk uh, that he's painting. It's something else. Is, is he painting the bridge towards the Christian world, towards the Catholic world? Uh, yeah. Uh, so he's uh, friends with uh, Jacques Maritain, uh, and Maritain has a uh, one of his paintings or a drawing in his uh, in his living room. And one of the bonds uh, between them uh, is Raisa, uh, who is Maritain's uh, wife, who's a, a convert from Judaism. Uh, and so Chagall and she understood each other uh, very, very well. She even wrote a book about him uh, at some point. And the way she saw Chagall was as someone who occupied uh, the shadow land between Judaism and Christianity. And I think this appeal to Chagall, I'm not an expert, uh, so I perhaps should be reticent. Um, and he painted in that, uh, in that idiom, in an idiom uh, that Christian uh, viewers could understand. Uh, and so when he painted uh, that Christ is a Jew on the cross, it was as much as a way of saying, and he started to do this in the late 30s and did it throughout the war and into the post-war period, is that what's happening to the Jews is a modern day crucifixion. Christ was a Jew uh, and the destruction of European Jewry was a new crucifixion. And if you Christians take your faith seriously, and he's saying this directly to Raisa and Jacques Maritain, uh, you will rise uh, up and protest against this. And the Maritain do, in fact. Uh, they do take uh, do take action. Um, the question is, uh, and it shows up in some of the other pairings that I talk about of Catholics and Jews like Francois Mauriac and Elie Wiesel, is uh, in order to address Christian audiences, how much do Jews sacrifice? Uh, of the uh, of the experience uh, that they have endured uh, as a people by dressing it in some sense in Christian clothing, uh, and do they deny uh, an aspect uh, aspect of it? And I try to suggest yes, but ultimately no, uh, and that these are all provocations to people uh, to rethink their faith, mm -hmm. uh, to Christians in particular mm -hmm. to rethink their faith, and what. Julie Zak, who's a well-known uh, Jewish polemicist in the post-war period, uh, what he called the teaching of contempt, uh, mm -hmm. and that this was what the Catholic Church had been involved in for millennia, in effect, uh, teaching Christians to be contemptuous of Jews, and it was time to change that teaching. Uh, so that using some of this Christological language uh, was a way not of betraying Judaism, uh, but of provoking uh, non-Jewish audiences uh, to mm. step back and do some soul searching. Mm. Well, you know, that I, I think there's another example of this that I think I read slightly differently than, than you do. Um, it's André Schwarzbach's Last of the Just, a very uh, famous and celebrated uh, prize-winning uh, novel. At the end of the, the book has two elements that are, I think, deeply uh, profound challenges to Jewish thinking about the Holocaust. The first is that the words 
of the Kaddish, the prayer for the dead, are interspersed with the names of the concentration camps, uh, which is Primo Levi's uh, statement, either there's Auschwitz or there's God. Uh, you can't have both. And the second part of it is that Schwarzbach cites a legend of Hanina ben Taradion, who's being burned by the Romans. And to make his torture last, they put some green uh, faggots in the Torah scroll in which he is uh, bound. Uh, and his students ask him, Rebbe, what do you see? And he says, the parchment is burning, but the letters are taking wing. And both of these I take to be deep challenges to martyrology. Uh, that that there there's something that happens in Jewish memory of the Holocaust, which moves away from Kiddush Hashem, that you die by you, the way you sanctify the name of the Lord is by dying, into the way that you sanctify the name of the Lord is by living, but Kiddush Hashem. And I wonder if you would read uh, Schwarzbach's book, even though the man is taking the children and he doesn't have to, he is a Lamed Vav in that sense. There's a deep challenge to Jewish ideas of religiosity and, and indeed of mourning the dead, uh, which Schwarzbach, I think in a brilliant way, in the end of his novel provides. So the, the Jewish position is in some ways crystallized, if I can use that word, by uh, the, the Klausfelds in their radical, in-your-face militancy, very much soixante-huitard, as you show. But I think uh, Schwarzbach does more to challenge Jewish thinking. Um, the last of the just means something. There are no just anymore. Yeah. And as a result of that, I wonder whether you might say something about the destabilization of Jewish memory of the Holocaust when the idea of martyrdom no longer fits. So very complex. Uh, uh, I, I, I share your reading of the end of the Schwarzbach. Uh, in fact, he described uh, the Holocaust as representing Shoah. He didn't have the word yet at the end of the theological age yeah. uh, and so there's this is a, a break or a rupture uh, and that in the aftermath of that uh, uh, of writing this novel which was published in 19, 1959 also he's a very young man and uh, there's also a, a, what would you call it, a bit of a scandal around the book uh, that maybe he had plagiarized some of it and he'd misrepresented the legends and so uh, he actually left the country and went off to the to the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, did return, but the Caribbean was his home, and he married a woman from there and wrote novels about Caribbean experience, about slavery, and got very involved in third world uh, third world politics. So for him, uh, this was a uh, a kind of farewell, uh, but not entirely, uh, because those third world revolts have a little bit of the Holocaust built. Into yes. them, but I, I do think you're uh, absolutely right. Uh, he is not a believer. He does not remain a man of faith. Uh, he tries to understand faith, uh, uh, Jewish faith, uh, in uh, the last of the just, but he does not share it. Uh, and that's built into the exactly because you could see this story of the uh, Ben Taradian of uh, Hanina Ben Taradian as a, a story where uh, the letters fly, uh, and so in some sense. The wisdom remains. Uh, it's not lost to us. Uh, but then he talks about thinking of uh, the dead on a melancholy day. Uh, and it's a very sad. And then comes the prayer, which is lacerating. Yeah. The yeah. To talk about it. So it is yes, saying you can't. And it's very different from Wiesel, who's kind of sidles up to that position yes. and yes. then says, no, I can't do that. I still believe in the covenant, yeah. I still believe uh, in the uh, uh, in the moment at Sinai, at the giving of the law, uh, and he he can't and remains inside the religious fold where God still uh, still exists. So uh, I would say, is it a turning point? No, I think you get a, a different. Yes, you do get, it. and it shows up uh, also in some of the texts I talk about. This kind of dark vision, uh, Piotr Ravitz with a crazy Jew. Uh, a crazy God who rules over a demented universe, uh, mm -hmm. so that God is still going to be there. It's because he's a madman uh, to have created a universe uh, yes. like yes. Or Anna Langfus, yes. uh, even Lanfman himself, who yes. opens up with the biblical citation, no. but uh, but God is not present in no. this story no. anyway. It's not as though the sacral dimension disappears. I haven't been to the Holocaust Museum in Skokie. I, I would have gone this last summer if COVID had allowed it. But apparently, if there's a 
the museum uh, wants very much to expose people to survivors. Uh, and I have not, uh, I haven't been there, so I don't know, but someone told me about it. And there is a kind of, uh, that this person who is still alive brings a special wisdom yeah. to the stories that they're telling that has a, a sacral feel to yeah. it in some way. And so feelings of awe uh, are still there. And I, so I think it's that sacral story remains, uh, but there's another one to compete with it. Yes, uh, yes, that, that's that's the darker tonality that you're talking about. Yes. Well, on, on that, um, I, I was very interested to learn, uh, which I didn't know before reading your book, uh, that the Yiddish version of Elie Wiesel's Night has a much angrier element, which was edited out of the English version. Why did he do that? You know, if you think about the the dedication of uh, Primo Levi's If This Be a Man or Survivor in Auschwitz in the terrible translation of the title, in, uh, in, in, at least in the United States, uh, he starts off with, uh, with a, a terribly bitter recasting of the Shema, uh, saying, if you forget this, you know, let every horror come back to you. Why did, why did Wiesel cut the, cut the anger out? Why did that happen? I understand it's a shorter book and it's beautiful in its in its dimensions, but is there another reason for that? Uh, so, not an expert, uh, but uh, the way the book ends in Yiddish is with uh, an expression of anger. Uh, Germany is rearming, uh, so he, I have to remember exactly, uh, he wrote it in the midst of debates about German rearmament in, oh, the, early, yeah. uh, in the early 50s, the Yiddish, uh, the Yiddish version. And he's furious uh, about this. Uh, and the anger is there. Uh, and there's also a scene, uh, you know, the Ilse Koch still roams the world. Uh, and, uh, and we're rearming this people. How is this possible? Um, so there, there are different versions of how this gets edited out. Uh, one is that he goes to Le Soy, uh, which is a publishing house uh, run by a man named Paul Flamand, who is a very, very serious Roman Catholic, um, uh, open-minded, ecumenical man. Uh, and uh, he had it was assigned to an editor, and the editor, uh, also a man of Catholic persuasion, uh, I won't say insists, but persuades uh, a toning down. Uh, oh, I'm. Uh, uh, no, I'm. I'm making. I'm making it up. Erase. Uh, erase, <laughs> erase that. I'm doing Schwarzbart. I'm not doing Lissoy. Um, it could be Moriac uh, who was responsible for this. Yes. Dream, who yeah. surprise uh, supplies yeah. La Nuit uh, with the with the preface. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's a little bit different. I think some of it has to do with the translation from Yiddish into, uh, into, into French, and it, sure, it had to be a shorter uh, a shorter book. That was what was what was desired, and I think there was a desire uh, to make it less of a Jewish book, not a racist yeah. Jewishness yeah. altogether. That was uh, impossible, uh, and also uh, to seek out a different kind of um, flavor uh, to the book, uh, one that would not be angry uh, in nature. Uh, in fact, there's a great article called The Scandal of Jewish Rage. Uh, that's the title. And you didn't want to have the angry Jew yeah. on your hands. Uh, and so a different kind of face had to be presented to the French public uh, yes. that would make, how should I put it, uh, that the public would listen to uh, in a way that it might turn off, oh, an angry Jew, I don't have to listen. I don't have yes. to pay attention. Yes. Uh, and I, I think that was, and it may also have been Wiesel's strategy too. I'm haven't talked to him. I didn't get a chance to to meet him, uh, in, uh, to my regret. Uh, but so it was maybe overdetermined, a little bit of Lassoy, a little bit of uh, Wiesel, a little bit of, uh, um, it wasn't Lassoy. It was, uh, it was Edition de Minuit that published uh, Wiesel. Uh, so, uh, but it also made Jérôme Blandon, who was yeah. the editor there, he might not have liked it either. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's extraordinary. It's on my way to the, uh, uh, Mayori, the town hall of the third arrondissement where I got my COVID shot yesterday, is a bust of Elie Wiesel in the children's garden. Uh, and it has that uh, haggard look of his face. It has a, a very, it's a powerful expressionist um, representation of a man who really is a universal figure, uh, who has the suffering of his people written into yeah. his face. And I, and I think the universality, is, as, you, as you show it, is, is something that is 
is really quite stunning. You know, as I said, I'm particularly interested in the contrast with uh, Primo Levi, who had a very different relationship to to Judaism, not at all as deep or as uh, steeped in the Hungarian yeah. uh, uh, mysticism of, of Wiesel's uh, uh, early life. But the you know the, the the feel I get from from your book is that there's an instability at the end of the story of what Jewish memory of the Holocaust really is, and writers and poets are deeply involved. Think of Paul Celan for a moment. Uh, as a, a French man who committed suicide in Paris, a man who taught the Ecole Normale Supérieure, who brought Romania to, to Paris and all that, there's, there's something powerfully unstable about Jewish stories. Uh, in some ways, just as the, when the European Union takes over the representation, it's no longer a French story or a German story, but it's what justifies the European Union. That seems to me to be a very powerful uh, element of your book. Just just before we turn to questions, uh, uh, Phil, I want to ask you something else that, about the French character of the story. I, I think there's a, a story there that I find absolutely stunning, which is the disproportionate role of Protestants, of French Protestants, in the uh, rescue of Jewish life. The, the town of chambon sur lignon is well known, but it's by no means the only example of it. Camus wrote, uh, indeed, in that uh, 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 in the hills, uh, in the mountains, in the fire, well, in the, the, in the farmland uh, around Chambon, that's where that's where he was, and he he re uh, remarked about it too. There is a Protestant story, not just a Catholic story, of the uh, of the power uh, of a community who, in France, know what persecution is, that established the Frenchness of the story. I wonder if you'd like to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, just a, just a little bit. Uh, it doesn't figure in the in the book. Uh, there is a pastor, Paul Westfall, who uh, does make an appearance as a member of a uh, of a Christian Jewish Friendship Association, the Amité Judéo Chrétienne. Uh, but other than that, no. Uh, and um, and it's not as though uh, some of the people, the Jews, uh, I do talk about who survived the war in hiding uh, in France, uh, didn't owe something to. Uh, to um, Protestant uh, Protestant helpers, um, but it doesn't. It, it's interesting. It didn't show up. Uh, it started until the 18, 1970s or nineteen eighties. As uh, maybe it's there, and I just I didn't see it. That's uh, that's completely possible. It's happened to me uh, in the past. Something before my eyes that I don't uh, that I don't see. Uh, and it's funny when I when I think of how I encountered this story uh, that you're telling me. Uh, it's through um, Pierre Sauvage's movie um, and uh, through Philip Halley's book. Uh, yeah. Through the English language, uh, or people who have come to the United States and then return uh, uh, to uh, to remember this uh, to remember this story. Um, now, of course, it's a major feature uh, of the discussion, and for the reasons uh, that you that you talk about, Protestants did play a disproportionate role, and for exactly as, as a persecuted minority, as generally speaking, a community uh, like the Jewish community in France that shared in commitment to the Republic and the principles of liberty, equality, uh, and uh, and fraternity, uh, and that is to say, as spiritual brothers, uh, which they've been since the days. Uh, of the Third Republic, even earlier in the 1860s and 1870s, when the France was becoming democratic and Jews and Protestants uh, militated shoulder to shoulder on behalf of Republican, small r, uh, Republican, uh, Republican values. So that this experience of sauvetage, of rescue, uh, is uh, is a re reiteration uh, of a relationship that was uh, that was really really yes. dec uh, yes. decades old. Yes. Well, on that point, maybe the last question before we turn to uh, our uh, our fellow listeners. Um, this is a long uh, problem, but I, I'd like to put it to you anyway as a closing question. Where do you stand on the view that 75 percent of the French Jewish population was saved? Yes. Is that a remarkable achievement or was it a terrible uh betrayal of 25%. I mean, I don't wish to quantify suffering. That's the wrong thing. But many people in France have argued over this and contrasted France 
loss to the Netherlands, 75% loss. Do you, do you have a view on this particular question? Uh, I have do I do. Uh, it's not set in stone uh, because it has evolved already. Um, some of the story uh, has to do with French topography. Uh, so it actually helps to have mountains, um, which the Dutch and the Belgians don't have the way, uh, the way the French do, uh, some place that you can run to and hide. Uh, and there's always the Italian story so that there is a zone, uh, which, uh, where persecution only for a brief period, but yeah. every month helps, uh, where this is, uh, this kind of danger is being, uh, is being run. Uh, it does help also uh, that uh, the Nazis didn't have large concentrations of troops on the spot. Uh, they were off fighting on the Eastern Front. And where there are lots of German soldiers, lots of Jews will die. Uh, and, and that's not the case in France until, uh, until the liberation. Uh, and uh, that's, a bloody, uh, that's a bloody moment. All that said, so this is all ways of saying it's not thanks to the generosity of the French people that so many Jews survived. Understanding, you can flip the thing and saying one, one Jew deported because of a, a denunciation or a collaboration or anti-Semitic policy. And Vichy was an anti-Semitic regime and immediately. Uh, that is to say, just to insist upon that point, uh, people since we have a new administration in the United States. What do you do on day one? This is what Vichy did on day one. Actually, it was day 35 or something like that. But close it, enough, it, close it enough. It mattered to them uh, to persecute Jews. That was important. Uh, so, uh, and Vichy had uh, substantial public support at the beginning, uh, which eroded over time. Uh, and that too is part of the 25% deportation story. On the other hand, uh, I do remember Stanley Hoffman's review of, uh, uh, of the sorrow and the pity, I think it was. Uh, and he says, you know, uh, oh, fools is a little hard uh, on the French. Uh, and that, you know, there were people who looked after me and protected me and my mother uh, in the Nice area of Pays. And uh, it's a complicated story. And as you know, Jay, uh, you meet French Jews of a certain generation if they open up and they're reluctant to, but if they do, they have a story uh, of some kind, uh, and it, some of it involves Jews helping Jews. Uh, some of it involves uh, luck, uh, but some of it also involves some French person uh, who came to their uh, to their aid. Uh, and so, the way I would put it is, it's not a story to pat yourself on the back about, uh, but. Uh, if you think how much worse it could have been uh, and was elsewhere uh, in Europe, uh, it was bad enough as it was. Um, but uh, there are stories of rescue as well, and not just the odd one, no. uh, as in the case no. of Poland, but it's something that that many people uh, that many people tell. This would be my you know my conclusion that you know your book is a a remarkable achievement because it shows that there are bridges between the generation of resistance and the generation of Jewish memory. There, there, really, it, there, there are continuities as well as uh, discontinuities in your story. And, and one of them is, is the number of people who made it possible, uh, who, policemen who notified kindergartens, don't go to school tomorrow, stay out of there. Or, little acts of greatness are great. Uh, and they they were multiple, and uh, uh, you know once what I need to do is uh, simply say uh, uh, that I am among the many who are grateful for the scholarship uh, you put into telling the story as beautifully as you have. So l let's see now if we can have some questions from from our uh, uh, from our fellow listeners. Um, right. Uh, here's here's one that I wanted to put you. Can you please tell me? If it examines the influence of women writers, surviving deportees, and philosophers in discussions about writing the catastrophe, as, for example, Blanchot, Lyotard, and confrontation with complicity and collaboration. If it does, what is the argument you make about their influence, women's writers' influence, and lasting imprint in memory culture? So, um, one is a, a missed opportunity. Uh, so the work remains to be done. Uh, so philosophers, uh, and I don't just mean um, 
Blanchot, but uh, Vladimir Jankalevich, uh, there or, or Levinas. Uh, this is uh, it's a rich uh, uh, source base uh, that the names appear, uh, but I don't really deal uh, with the uh, with the with the work. There are women uh, women writers who do get um, serious treatment in the book. Um, I mean, just quickly thinking two in particular, Germain Tillon. Yeah. Uh, who uh, is in the Panthéon uh, yeah. today, uh, a well-known uh, figure. Oh, yes, and there's a, uh, and a second one who is a particular favorite, Charlotte Delbeau. Delbeau uh, yeah. So if I can do anything, uh, uh, you know, tell people what to read, uh, this may not be on everyone's reading list, Delbeau's work, uh, yeah. uh, a trilogy uh, of, uh, of books uh, that came out under the collective title Auschwitz et Après. Uh, I don't know how it's translated into uh, Auschwitz yeah. and afterwards. Or after something. and after, Auschwitz and after. Uh, and, uh, but these are, uh, how should I put it, uh, uh, non-Jewish women, they're résistantes. Yeah. Uh, and so you get the resistance story uh, that's told there. And it's a story, very classic, but with a in a woman's voice, having to do with what happens to women's bodies under duress and the kind of fellowship and camaraderie that exists among uh, among women deportees. Um, uh, the Dalbo is quite wonderful, is that she's very clear-eyed and uh, acid uh, uh, at times. Um, so uh, so there is uh, that's where the uh, the yeah. women and there's a there's a women's uh, so Ravensbrück uh, was a camp where women were uh, deportees yeah. were were sent uh, and there is an organization of Ravensbrück uh, survivors, uh, Jean-Vivre de Gaulle Antonias. Uh, shows yes. up in my book, and it's a Catholic voice, uh, a very, very powerful, uh, moving one uh, that also comes in uh, for uh, for discussion in my uh, in my book. And she was there with Anis Postel Vinay, uh, and also with Germain Tillon, and they provide a lot of solidarity for each other. And they also will support Delbo at some point, although Delbo yes. comes out of a communist background rather than yes. a Hollister Catholic. Yes, uh, there is a bonding that takes place across yeah. these political uh, political differences, and the claim is made, uh, at least by Tion, uh, is that the women had uh, a greater ability to experience solidarity than men who were divided by politics uh, in a way uh, that the women were able to not set aside entirely, but to to mute or moderate. Yes, yes. Well, here's another question from the audience. Uh, you mentioned the impact of the Algerian war. Did this transform thinking about concentration camps in yeah. France? So terrific, uh, terrific question. Um, so uh, it, it won't surprise you to learn that people read it two ways. Uh, and, and so it's not as a, it's not as though it's neat. Uh, and uh, it turns out there are concentration camps, uh, that the internment camps. The French uh, military said, don't use yeah. the word concentration camp uh, to describe this because that will conjure the wrong kind of uh, kind of memory. Uh, and some people uh, said, well, see, you know, these are just circumstantial. Uh, they're bad things. We shouldn't have done it. Uh, but we're not like the Nazis. We're not like uh, we're not like the Soviets, uh, for that matter. Whereas there were others, particularly coming out of the non-communist left, who were very, very hard hitting on this and say, no, we are now engaged in the very same tactics the Gestapo engaged in, uh, and we must bring this war to an end. And sometimes, in a number of instances, by any means necessary, and that meant by joining in, uh, joining when uh, FLN networks and essentially embedding the enemy in this particular yes. war. So the deportee community split over this. Uh, the split isn't quite neatly along political lines uh, with the left critiquing uh, and the Gaulists and Catholics staying on board. You get someone like Anise postel Vinet, <coughs> who is a Gaullist, a Robinsbrook survivor, and she she wanted her organization to pronounce against the Algerian war. Uh, and she and jean Vieve de Gaulle uh, had some differences over uh, over this instance. So here is a case where the, uh, the Algerian war uh, divides not just left and right, but even yes. within the world of the right itself. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, here's another question uh, for you, Phil. Um, how did returnees negotiate overlapping identities, French, Jewish, and indeed communist in many cases? Yes. Uh, 
So it's going to vary uh, enormously, uh, and it will change uh, over over time. And that's one of the things that's uh, that's interesting uh, interesting to see. Communist deportees come back, <clears throat> uh, and there's there's always a little tension. Uh, not so much at the beginning, uh, but if you were Jewish and a communist, uh, that was fine until uh, the Cold War set in, uh, and to the degree that Soviet Union either uh, wanted to. Uh, downplay the Jewish side of the story, but it was always maintained, uh, remained a, a feature. And then in the 1970s, a lot of communist Jewish deportees uh, decided, well, these two identities are hard to hold together, uh, oh. and I'm going to separate them, and leave the party, uh, and and go with the Jewish side of the, uh, of the, of the story. So that's one case where the identities actually shift over the uh, over the decades. Another way is, uh, and this is very interesting, is a number of résistants. Who, uh, Marie Claude Vaillant Couturier is a good example. She's a communist deportee, uh, a, a representative, was sent to Robbinsbrook. Uh, but by the 1980s, uh, she's less communist. Uh, she will be. Uh, 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 have an official function and uh, memorialization. We'll even talk about how important uh, what happened to the Jews was and the Jews suffered more than the Résistants did. So that you get some Résistants saying, initially our story was the central and most important one. The Jewish story was something else and minor. Uh, and then they come to accept the reversal of memory that takes place in the 1970s and, 19, uh, and 1980s. Um, then there are those who are you know, solid, Throughout, uh, they tend to be uh, non-communist left, and they stick. They stick with it, uh, and they don't. There's nothing they have to give up. Uh, they, you know, when the Soviet Union is exposed or critique is having a gulag, uh, this doesn't surprise them, and they can deal, they can deal with it. Uh, and particularly for Trotskyists, it's no uh, it's no problem. And a, and a case in point is uh, uh, is uh, is uh, David Rousset, uh, yes. who was Trotskyist and. In fact, he's one of the ones who, uh, who's a leftist, non-communist leftist. Even when he flirts with the Gaul, it's as a left Gaullist. Um, mm. So he's uh, he's he's pretty he's pretty consistent. Yes. Well, let well, let's talk about the the right a little bit. Um, Simon Weil is a really interesting figure. Uh, would you be able to talk a little bit about those who remained, shall we say, within the traditional political right? In, in French politics who were deportees. Is she an unusual figure or were they others who gathered around uh, what might be described as conventional French right-wing politics? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good one and a tough one. And I, so what I'm gonna say is more, uh, is more speculative in nature. It's easy with Catholic deportees with a very powerful Catholic uh, yeah. identity that yeah. will draw them to a certain uh, right, um, as in the case of Geneviève de Gaulle. Um, and I call her right wing. She's, you know, better. all right. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, but you can't say that about Simone Weil. Oh. Uh, so uh, the puzzle is. Uh, on the other hand, I, I see her as kind of the progressive right, open yes. minded. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, Giscardien uh, sort of. Uh, I think that's uh, that's where she first uh, serves in uh, in Giscard's uh, in Giscard's world. And here the identification. Uh, is with uh, not just with Jewish experience, but with the resistance. Yes. Uh, so um, that's uh, right. Then, uh, oh, fool's movie uh, comes out. The sorrow and the pity. Um, Germain Tion doesn't like it. Doesn't like it. It no. makes the resistance, as she understands the experience, look bad. Yes. I think I think oh, fool's is a little more complicated on the resistance than many people think. But and she and Simone Weil see eye to eye about. Uh, that they're they're shoulder to shoulder on this, and a kind of center right uh, Gaullist perspective. Yeah. Uh, they, Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, subscribe to a certain understanding of the resistance, and uh, that endures. Um, and part of what places them uh, where they are on the uh, uh, on the political checkerboard, uh, more in the Gaullist or progressive center right camp. Just, uh, just uh, you know, sort of adjacent to that question, there's another one, uh, the last one perhaps we have time for. The question is, what can you tell us about the organizations of survivors and their political role uh, in French politics? Did, did the FND uh, IRP 
play a particular role? Did, it, did they position themselves in the center or how would you see their presence? Yeah. So that's one of the themes of the book. I have a weakness for organizations, uh, which yeah. may be unfortunate uh, yeah. because they all have acronyms and acronyms you know, cause people's eyes to blur fairly, uh, fairly quickly. But the, the major one is that one uh, initially, the FNDIRP, uh, which is an umbrella organization <coughs> uh, with communists at the top, uh, and uh, they agitate uh, early on uh, for generous benefits for former uh, former deportees, deportees of labor, that is to say people who were uh, uh, conscripted to go work in German uh, war factories. Uh, the FNDIRP wanted them to get benefits of some kind, uh, and other resistance organizations or deportee survivor organizations uh, felt that, uh, no, you didn't want to be generous. It was an elite that, that had really gotten deported, uh, and they deserved elite treatment. Um, then comes the Cold War, and the FNDERP splits, uh, and a new uh, institutional nexus comes into being in 47, 48, the FNDER and the UNADIF. I mean, I don't, you see how quickly uh, <laughs> those, um, but they're much more mainstream uh, in, in political uh, in political terms. And one more organization that is worth mentioning, an, an UNADIF spinoff is the Réseau du Souvenir. It's the, the network of memory. And they are very active in getting, as you know, Jay, there's a national deportation remembrance day. Uh, and it's the Réseau du Souvenir that gets this created. Uh, there's a quite wonderful memorial behind uh, Notre Dame, uh, the Memorial au Martyr de la Déportation on the Ile de la Cité. The Réseau du Souvenir gets this. There is an annual competition uh, that is for high school students uh, to write uh, essays about resistance and deportation. And the Réseau du Souvenir is central uh, in, the, uh, in the early 60s in turning this into a national institution. And it's still a big deal in France, uh, down to the present day, tens of thousands of high school students participate in this. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see my signal uh, to, uh, to wind up, uh, but it's a way of saying that the organizations are active, politically uh, fractious, uh, and consequential for public policy. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for your questions. Um, we're sorry if we didn't have time to answer any, um, I'd especially like to thank uh, Philip and Jay for a really fascinating talk and those insights into the book. And many thanks to all of you who joined us today. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. All the best.